Welcome to the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast brought to you by Break of Day Capital. The show focuses on educating syndicators and apartment owners on how to build systems and manage their properties more efficiently to become a best-in-class operator. 100% straight talk. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky with Break of Day Capital. Be sure to join our Facebook group, Asset Management Mastery, where we have a great community of thousands of like-minded individuals sharing resources and best practices. Today on the podcast, we have Jay Scott. Jay is a partner at Bar Down, Bar Down Investments, focusing on purchasing and repositioning large multifamily projects. He is also the author of five books. He's got a new one coming out. We'll we'll get to that later. Um, and one of them, the 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 best-selling book on flipping houses. I read that many years ago, and uh, I, I, when I flipped my first house, I, I definitely referenced, you know, went back to that book many times. Um, so, welcome, Jay. Can you start by telling the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Gary. I'm a big fan of yours, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a former engineer, business guy. Did the tech thing in Silicon Valley for much of my career, and then 2008. Uh, fortunate enough to meet my amazing wife. And um, we decided to get married and wanted to get away from those 80 hour work weeks. She was traveling three weeks a month. I was traveling a couple of weeks a month and it, it just, it didn't make sense uh, to start a family under those conditions. And so um, long story short, we ended up in real estate where we knew we could have some control over our work-life balance. We knew we could kind of put our family first and, and work second, um, but still make a good living. And so in 2008, we started flipping houses uh, flipped several hundred houses uh, over the next 10 years. And then in uh, 2018, 2019, decided to make the transition to multifamily and uh, um, reached out to a friend of mine, Ashley Wilson, who um, who uh, managed a company named Bar Down Investments. And she agreed to basically take me under her wing, mentor me about multifamily. And over the course of the next couple of years, uh, I did a couple of deals with her. We uh, realized that we had a lot of really good complementary skills. And then about a year and a half, two years ago, we decided to partner up. And so now I'm a 50-50 partner in Bar Down Investments. And, and Ashley and I are, are buying uh, multifamily around the country. Nice, nice. Choosing the right insurance coverage for multifamily properties isn't that complicated, if you know who to talk to. At the Garzella Group, we're uniquely qualified to help you navigate the range of policy choices you have, and we're committed to saving you 30% in the process. We do intensive market research and have nationwide relationships, so we can find coverage other insurance brokers simply can't. We should talk. Go to quotenow.biz, and we'll start the conversation. Yeah, I'm really impressed with what you guys are doing, and um, excuse me, and uh, yeah, glad to have you on the show. Um, Today, let's talk about the current economy and what the next six to 12 months um, are going to look like. Because as an asset manager, it's, it's so important to know where, where things are, are headed, to be, to be ahead of the curve. Um, and I read your, your posts on social media. And if, if people, if you're interested in this stuff, definitely follow Jay. He's got, it's very informative and easily digestible. So uh, definitely check it out. But uh, what are you currently seeing in the economy? Yeah. So, I mean, I think just like everybody, it, it's interesting. I think things are still really up in the air. Nobody really knows where things are headed. Uh, we're getting a lot of mixed data from the uh, from from like just coming out of the government in terms of, of metrics and and like trends. I mean, obviously, everybody's heard that we saw two quarters in a row of negative GDP, which for a lot of people means we're in a recession. Um Personally, I, it, it's a data point, but there are a lot of data points. If you look at other data points, it's not so clear that we're currently in a recession. I mean, you look at unemployment and we're like lowest unemployment numbers in, in, in U.S. history. Um, at the same time, you kind of dig into the employment data and you realize things aren't quite as rosy as they might seem. Um, businesses are still spending money. As of last month, businesses uh, were, were spending money 2% higher than the month before, which is a good sign. Uh, at the same time, a few days ago, I read a report that uh, that fifty percent of businesses were considering layoffs over the next several months, which is obviously like a catastrophe for 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 the employment numbers. So right now, I mean, things are kind of all over the map. The way I kind of interpret the data is 
Uh, there's still a lot of money out there. Um, obviously, inflation is still high. There's a lot of money that's been released over the last few years. Um, so what we're seeing is that a large segment of the population is still doing very well. Um, and we see that by virtue of the fact that the stock market's holding up and real estate values, even though um, uh, inventory might be going up and even though transaction volume might be going down, real estate values aren't really going down that much as of now. Um, and so that tells me that a large percentage of the population, specifically those who control a lot of the wealth, are doing really well still. At the same time, what we're seeing is that there are a number of people that are on the other side of the coin, the people that um, that are that that work jobs and, and living month to month, paycheck to paycheck, um, who are starting to struggle. And so we're, we're we've talked about that K-shaped recovery a lot where some people do really well, some people don't do so well. And I think we're, we're, we're getting to kind of the, the natural conclusion of that, where we have a very mixed economic outlook where part of the population is doing well, but a lot of the population is not. And my take is that over the next several months, what we're going to see is we're going to see this, this decline into what is clearly a recession. Now, that said, I think a lot of people have this misunderstanding of what recession means. A lot of us, especially, um, I'm, I'm an old guy, um, but I talk to a lot of younger people who their first real recession was 2008 that they remember. And if all you remember is 2008, you kind of assume that a recession is this catastrophic event where everything collapses. Well, the reality is we've had 30, this will be this would be the 35th recession in the last 160 years in the US. And do the math, 160 divided by 35. We have a recession every five or six years in this country. And so for anybody old like me, they remember back in 2001 when we had a recession or the early 90s or the late 80s or the early 80s where we had these other recessions where it was nothing like 2008. Um, people lost their jobs and, and there was some foreclosures and, and people weren't happy, but it wasn't a crash in the real estate market. It wasn't a crash in the stock market. Um, it was just a general year, year and a half, two years of general unhappiness. And so I think what we're most likely to see is we're going to see a recession. I, I don't think that's avoidable at this point. I think it's the only way we're going to get rid of inflation is to keep raising interest rates, which will take us into a recession. Um, but I think it's going to be more like a traditional recession where, um, yeah, we're going to see unemployment go up and we're going to see the stock market come down. But what a lot of people don't realize of those 35 recessions or 34 recessions that we've had over the last 160 years, 32 of them, real estate didn't get hit that hard. And I think this is going to be another one where real estate uh, is probably going to be more resilient than a lot of other asset classes. Yeah, I, people are so quick to to lump this, you know, recession into 2008. And it's just completely different. And banks aren't lending money, give, basically giving money away to anyone that can breathe. Literally, that's yep. what was going on. And and um, and consumer sentiment right now is is one of the lowest of all time. And it's, it's very interesting because um, it's, like you said, all this different data points, you know, negative, positive, negative, positive. You know, the savings is 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 near record highs. Um, certainly um consumer credit has uh, you know, people's spending has 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 continued when so before it was it was pretty low, but now now it's increased. But um it, it's it's definitely interesting with uh, it, when you're talking to investors, a lot of them want to you know, sit on the sidelines. Everyone talks about getting a good deal, but when there there are deals are out there right now, this is a really good buying opportunity. Quite honestly, with the the cost of capital up two percent, and maybe you're getting 15 percent discounts on on properties, which won't be there in six months. You know, a lot of people are still sitting on the sidelines, so it's it's uh, interesting times. Yeah. Um, and and talking about people sitting on the sidelines, the nice thing is, I mean, you and I, and I imagine many of your listeners have the same business model. Um, we're buying large multifamily. We're holding for three to five, maybe even a few years longer, three to five years. Um, and then we're reselling. And just to throw out a couple more boring facts, but, but boring facts that are kind of important in this context. Um, over the last 60 years, we've had 10 of these cycles where um, where we start to see inflation. The Federal Reserve raises interest rates to kind of slow down inflation. That leads us into a recession. And then by the time we get into that recession, the Federal Reserve realizes, OK, uh, inflation is now at a reasonable level. We can start lowering interest rates again to get us out of that recession. 
And so this is that that pattern of, of inflation, recession, and then lower interest rates again. Um, that's again happened about 10 times over the past 60 years. Every single one of those times, what we've seen is that that cycle has lasted less than two years, which means from the day the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates to the day that they start lowering interest rates has never been longer than two years. Now, I'm not going to say this time won't be different. Of course, every time could be different. But if history is any indicator, it's been about six months since we started raising interest rates. We're probably within a year or a year and a half of interest rates starting to come down again. So any properties we buy today or next week or next month or later this year, um, we're likely to see that by the time we go to sell those in three years or four years or five years, the market is, is most likely going to be recovered. So even though people are kind of sitting on the sidelines today, and I, and I understand why people are doing that. A lot of us want to see where interest rates going, where values going, where cap rates going. Um, but when you get to the point where you're comfortable buying, now is not going to be a bad time to buy because it's very likely that by the time we're ready to sell, interest rates are going to be a good bit lower and the market's going to be heating up again. Cap rates are going to drop again. And, and so I, I think now is not really necessarily a bad time to buy for anybody that has our business model of a three to five year hold. I'm curious, if our, um, do you care if it's um, you're putting fixed uh, debt on it or you uh, or bridge, you know, a floating rate? What's your philosophy on that? Yeah. So for, for again, talking about multifamily, large multifamily, um, these days, it's really tough to get fixed agency debt um, just because the numbers don't work. Basically, we, we have this metric um, uh, DSCR, so debt service coverage ratio, where essentially the, the lenders, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, require us to be, um, to, to be making a certain amount of money over our mortgage payment every month. And so they loan based on how much money we're bringing in every month. And so with interest rates higher and our, obviously our mortgage payments higher, what we're seeing is that to get that type of debt, typically our loan to value or loan to cost is now somewhere around 50, 55, maybe 60% if we're lucky, which means we now to need to raise 40, 45, 50% of, 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 of our money through equity, which is a lot more expensive than debt. Um, and so I, I think a lot of, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, we've seen this, a lot of uh, multifamily investors these days are moving away from those nice Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. Um, they're moving to bridge debt. Bridge debt's um, basically interest only in a lot of cases, which means our mortgage payments are lower, which means we can borrow a higher percentage. We can still get 65, 70, maybe even 72% loan to value or loan to cost. So a lot of people are moving to bridge debt. But like you alluded to, the, the, the downside of bridge debt is that it's not fixed rate. A lot of the times it's variable rate. So you have to buy a rate cap if you don't want rates to, to, to risk rates going higher than, than what you can expect. And, and rate caps these days are really expensive. You'd be spending $500,000, a million dollars on a rate cap. Um, in addition, they're generally not 10-year loans like we see with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They're generally three years. Maybe we get three years, plus we can buy another year and buy a fifth year if we're lucky. Um, but again, we need to be putting out money to buy those additional years. Um, and so uh, essentially, we, we have this option these days where it's a good option, but there's risk involved. And we need to spend money to mitigate that risk. We need to spend money to, to buy down the rate caps. We need to spend money to buy additional years. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, that debt ends up being pretty expensive. Um, but again, it gets us it gets us the highest loan to value or loan to cost ratio, which means we can raise less money, less equity, which is really expensive. And so that's kind of what I expect to see over the next uh, over the next few months. That that a lot of people are, are moving towards bridge debt, and um, and again, we're all betting on the fact that in three years, four years, um, rates are down again, so that if we're still holding those properties, we can refinance into longer term fixed rate debt. I'm curious, um, besides your debt, you know, any other um, aspects of your business plan has changed, you know, recently given given the economic um, situation we're in? Yeah, the biggest thing is just our, our exit cap rates. Um, so uh, historically, like I think in the industry, it's pretty typical to assume every year um, that you hold the property that you, you assume cap rates are going to go up maybe 15 basis points, maybe 10, maybe 20, depending on your market and your level of comfort, but 10 to 20 basis points uh, per year. So if you hold it for five years, you assume that you're going to have somewhere between three quarters of a point and a point higher on your exit cap rate. 
Um, these days, I think a lot of people and us included, we're still assuming that 15 basis points, but we're also adding a half point, like just to be safe. So instead of three quarter point over, over the next three or five years, we're saying a point and a half. Um, and again, I think there's a reasonable chance. This is the nice thing. There's a reasonable chance that three or four or five years from now, the market could be hot again and cap rates could come down. But we don't want to tell our investors that we're betting, uh, that our strategy is betting on, on cap rates coming down. So we need to be conservative. We need to model cap rates that are, our exit cap rates that are higher than they are today by a decent amount. Um, and that makes it more difficult to get the numbers to work um, because obviously your sale price is going to be lower than it would be with lower cap rates. Um, and suddenly you need to get a much better deal um, to, to make the numbers work. And sellers, as of today, and we're recording this in what, the end of, of August, uh, as of today, sellers don't seem to be really open to, to fire sailing their properties. Um, so so it's, it's tough to find deals today. Yeah. I'm definitely uh, seeing a lot less on the market, but off market, if you hit a price, then, then it's yeah. yours. And most buyers have, have, uh, at least in, in in Phoenix and Tucson, where I'm looking, have definitely lowered their expectation level. Yep. Yeah. And and so I, I think what we're going to see over the next six months, um, we're not necessarily going to see a big drop in values. And I'm I'm just I'm guessing here. I don't have a crystal ball, and, and I'm not uh, an economic genius. I'm just guessing here. Um, but we saw this in 2008 as well, uh, especially at the beginning of the 2008 crisis, um, where sellers weren't yet desperate. They weren't yet willing to, to drop their prices considerably. Buyers obviously um, weren't willing to pay ridiculous prices when they see uh, potential risk coming. And so what we have is we have sellers up here and buyers down here, and maybe sellers come down a little and buyers come up a little bit, um, but we're not meeting in the middle very much. And so what we see is there's just very little transaction volume. There's very few sales. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean prices are going to drop. It just means that there isn't going to be nearly as much sales volume as, as, as there previously was. And so that's what I suspect is going to happen over the next six to 12 months is we're going to see a big drop off in sales volume. Um, we certainly are going to see cap rates expand a little bit, which means we're going to see prices drop a little bit, but I don't think it's going to, again, it's not going to be a 2008, in my opinion, 2008 type event. We're just going to see a softening and we're going to see less, less, fewer transactions. Yep, absolutely. I agree. Let's take a couple minutes to talk about your your latest book, your fifth book. I know how hard it was to write one book, never mind five books. So huge kudos to you. What's the name of the book and when's it coming out? Yeah, I, I took four years to write this one. Like it, it was a <laughs> tough book to write, and I really wanted it to be perfect. And my co-author is Dave Meyer. He's the uh, the head of of uh, data and analytics at Bigger Pockets, and the book is called Real Estate by the Numbers. And it's basically, um, if I had to retitle it, I'd probably have called it uh, Think Like an Investor because it's really, it's all the math, the numbers, but also the strategies and the concepts that go into really thinking like a successful investor. So we talk about everything from like the very basics of, of how financial statements work for your business, um, how to, how to uh, analyze your business and look at its efficiency, um, look at your personal financial statement and look at where you currently are um, through covering like the, the nitty gritty of all the popular metrics that we're used to seeing, cash on cash um, and AAR and IRR and equity multiples and explaining what those things mean and how we get those numbers. Um, then talking about capital stacks, like all the details of how debt works and how equity works and how you can be using debt and equity together um, to be like basically making your deals better than they are today. Um, then we have uh, a whole part of the book that's on concepts, like these high level strategic concepts that as investors, we have to understand time value of money, compounding effects, interest rate effects, how taxes impact your investments. And then finally, the Final chapter is, is really, uh, it goes into all the analysis techniques you need to do deal analysis for, for typical real estate type deals. So I, I like to think of it as like a, a, a reference book, a reference textbook, um, but one that you can also read beginning to end to really help you think, start thinking like an investor. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to read it. And I, I know it's going to be tremendously valuable to a lot of our listeners out there. So uh, looking you. forward to it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I asked this question of all of our guests. Uh, what is your asset management superpower? Uh, Ashley Wilson. 
<laughs> uh, honestly, no. So, um, and, and so maybe my, uh, my answer is going to be a little bit different, but we have to all know what we're really good at and what we're not really good at. And I know that asset management is not my superpower in general. And so when I entered this business, one of the things I said was, I'm going to focus on my strengths. And my strengths are things like I can raise money, I can do underwriting, I can do uh, market analysis and economic analysis, um, and kind of all the, the spreadsheet and analytical type stuff. I'm not the person you want day to day managing the business plan. So what I said was when I came into this business was I'm going to find somebody who is amazing at that. And I'm going to convince that person to, to partner with me. And so if anything, my superpower was getting somebody who is amazing at that to agree to partner with me so that I now have that as part of my business. And, and Ashley is, is probably one of the best asset managers that I've ever met. And I've learned so much about uh, asset management from her. And so if I had to pick one thing that I've learned from her um, that's really helped me when I think about asset management and I look at deals is this concept of absorption rate. Um, and it's something we don't think about enough. To typically, um, the most important thing we do when we're underwriting a deal is we look at comps for our properties. Um, we look at, at, at what is our post-renovation, post-management improvement uh, uh, rents, what are they going to be? And so too often we look at other properties and we just assume this other property that's also a B-class that was also, also built in 1986, that's six hundred yards away that whatever is necessarily going to be a good comp. Um, but a lot of times we don't dig into the unit unit mixes enough. And when you start to dig into the unit mixes, you might realize, okay, my property has the majority two bedroom, two bath deals. That property has four two bedroom, two bath out of 600 units. And so we see the rents for their two bedroom and two bath at 1500. We assume we can get 1500, but we ignore the fact that they only have four of those to rent. So they're going to get a premium. If we have 300 of those types of units, most likely our, our, our absorption rate, the amount of the number of units we can rent at the highest, uh, at the highest market rent is going to be lower. And so we have to kind of adjust for that. And so um, I think for me, I spend a lot of time uh, looking at market rents and doing comps. Um, and that's probably been like the biggest takeaway for me is that too many uh, investors don't look at this concept of absorption rate and, and don't end up doing a real apples to apples comparison of their property to other properties when they're doing the comps. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good metric um, for people to look at. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And thanks for coming on and sharing your wisdom about the, the current state of the economy and what you guys are doing differently. Where can listeners find out more about you and bar down investments? I appreciate that. Um, so anybody that wants to connect with me, find out more about Bar Down or anything I'm doing, you can go to www.connectwithjscott.com. And that'll link out to, to everything I've got. So www.connectwithjscott.com. Awesome. Uh, this is Gary Lipsky signing off. I'll be back next week with another informative episode on the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast. Thanks, Gary. To all of our listeners, thanks for joining us. And if you like this episode, Please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and like, subscribe, and review this podcast as it will help us grow our audience and reach more people. And if you'd like to learn more about what we do at Break of Day Capital, head over to our website, breakofdaycapital.com, and sign up for our newsletter and or fill out our investor application. We'll talk to you next week.